It is now my honor to introduce Rachel Stern. I'll sit down. Dave will hold the mic. Until tonight, I haven't spoken publicly about my experience regarding the Pigua. I'm a true introvert and public speaking is not my kind of thing. Having said that, I feel compelled to go out of my comfort zone in order to tell my experience and publicly thank Hashem for the great Nesca Lui he has performed for myself and for my husband. On Sunday, March 19th, Dave and I left our house to go to the Mahon Chilo Shiur in Yerushalayim. We had gone several times before and it's something that's very meaningful and important to us to us. We decided to leave the house just a bit earlier than we usually would so that we'd have time to do a quick errand on the way. We picked up our three-year-old from Ma'on about a half hour early, said goodbye to our three kids, our oldest was way at Pnimiya, and left. It was a rainy day, everything seemed ordinary, even peaceful. No traffic, no Arabs rioting or throwing rocks. A regular normal drive, we approached a traffic circle and stopped to let a pedestrian cross the road. Something seemed off about this person. He was walking slow, slowly very close to our car and had one hand concealed in a very strange way. I quickly said to Dave, why is he hiding his hand? Before he had a chance to respond, the man turned towards us and pulled out a gun. Dave simultaneously, with lightning speed, drew his weapon and they immediately started firing at each other. I couldn't believe that this scenario was playing out. It's something you hear about, not something you think you'll actually experience. Adrenaline kicked in fast, my thoughts started to race, time slowed down. I thought to myself, this is how it ends for us. Right here, right now, we're going to die in this car. Our poor children, they'll be orphans. How will they manage? There was no escaping the situation, so I quickly got as close as I could to the passenger door and made myself as small as possible. I covered my ears with my hands, closed my eyes, and with each shot fired thought, this will be the bullet that kills me, over and over again. I felt glass and bullet casings flying all over the place. It felt like an eternity. In reality, this lasted for just a few seconds. According to the police report, the terrorists fired 18 rounds at our car. Suddenly, there was a deafening, deafening silence. I looked at my arms and legs and checked for gunshot wounds. I knew that with the adrenaline and shock I was experiencing, I could easily not realize I had been shot. Somehow, I didn't even have a single scratch. I wondered, am I alive? We actually survived this? But then I looked up at Dave and felt absolutely horrified. He was very pale, covered in blood, and looked like he had been hit several times. Blood was shooting out of his forehead, and his right arm seemed riddled with bullets. There were a few seconds where he just sat there leaning back in his seat, not speaking. I had never seen him look so tranquil, it was scaring me. I started crying, but due to the adrenaline, without any tears at all, and told him, Dave, you've been badly hit, you're shot in the head. Are you going to die? You look like you're dying. He told me very calmly that he has clear thoughts, and that must mean his brain is still working. <laughs> I didn't believe him. <laughs> um, then he started to drive. We drove a few hundred meters and stopped. He immediately pulled out a tourniquet. I know, I was also surprised. I had no idea that he had it on him. I was like, what are you doing? What is that? A tourniquet, obviously. <laughs> he placed it on his injured arm and told me to call the moked, the security forces, the local security forces. I quickly unbuckled my seatbelt, found my phone in my purse, and with my hand shaking, couldn't even remember how to use a phone. Like, what is this thing? How do you, like, what do you do with it? Um, finally, I managed to call and screamed from the depths of my soul that my husband is shot, he's badly injured, and we need an ambulance, and if they don't get here fast, he could die. It took eight minutes from the time I dialed, it took eight minutes from the time I dialed the, sorry, uh, from the time I dialed the moked for Mada and security forces to arrive. During that very stressful time, we applied bandages to his head wounds to try to stop the bleeding. He had bandages in his pocket as well. <laughs> Those eight minutes felt like an eternity. Arabs surrounded our car during that time and filmed us. They stared and they whistled. Of course, not even one came to try and help. I was very worried that we'd be dealing with a lynch situation if we didn't get help fast. 
Finally, ambulances and security forces arrived, and our, Dave's cousin, Sfi, was actually the first one to arrive at the scene <laughs> and had no idea that it was us at first. And I felt huge relief just knowing that this specific part of the nightmare was over. He was taken to the hospital in one ambulance and I in another. Once I was out of danger, the magnitude of the situation started to hit me. His wounds looked very, very bad, especially the head wounds. I knew he needed to be loads, but felt in that moment that I just didn't have it in me. Everything felt so final. I couldn't bring myself to feel any hope in this terrifying, hopeless situation. Then I had an idea. I need to call Rav Bar Chaim and ask him to say tefillot for him. I believe Hashem will hear his tefillot. The Rav luckily answered my call and said he would daven for him. Knowing that the Rav was pleading to Hashem on his behalf gave me the strength and focus I needed to do all the things I had to do. I still had to inform my kids, call Dave's parents, and several other people. There's no normal, non-dramatic way to give over that news, but I tried my best. I knew that word of the pigua would spread lightning fast, and I knew that these people had to hear about it directly from me. During the long ride to the hospital, my mind was racing with so many thoughts, very rational thoughts. I thought, who even survives after getting shot in the head? I quickly thought of several different people that died this way. People that even managed to call the moked themselves, who stayed alive for 10 minutes before dying on their way to the hospital. I started to realize that there's a high chance he won't make it. Will I have to go to his funeral tonight? My mind was hyper-focused on thoughts of how I'll have to manage alone. The kids, the farm, the life we built together, this dream life we had built suddenly felt like a huge burden, a burden that I would have to carry by myself. I decided in those moments that I would do it. Okay, I'll adjust, I'll force myself, I'll manage, I'll handle it all, I don't have a choice. When I got to the hospital, I was immediately enveloped by so many people, close friends, doctors, nurses, our cousins, psychologists, around 20 neighbors, the Rav of our Yishuv was even there. According to the Minahel of the hospital, Dr. Aaron Rotman, Dave was intubated and sedated, but was still alive and his vitals looked very, very good. He was the first person that I could believe was telling me the truth. He also told me that we'll only really know the extent of his injuries after the CT results come back. It's gonna poke me in the eye. <laughs> we all waited outside of the CT room impatiently for about an hour. After that, I was approached by several doctors who seemed utterly shocked and told me that the, I don't need to worry, he's going to be fine. Each bullet somehow missed vital organs, arteries, tendons, and in their path didn't even cause blood vessel damage. I asked about his head wound and was told that the bullet entered under his skin and exited, causing no damage to his skull and brain, no internal bleeding whatsoever. They told me that he'll have surgery to fix the broken bones in his arm, but he should regain full mobility. The Minahel, as well as several of the other doctors, told me that this was a Nes Galui. The Minahel went, went on the news and said, this is a Nes Galui. At that moment, all of my pain and worry turned into such unimaginable joy. Ishuat Hashem Keheref Ayin. It's hard for me to really describe that feeling, but it's something that I still feel to this day and I hope will stay with me always. I learned shortly after this that Dave, after having been shot several times, managed to empty an entire magazine and shoot the terrorists multiple times. He did that with zero visibility. Our windshield was completely riddled with bullets and shattered. You couldn't see through it. One of those bullets hit the terrorist's hand, which caused him to drop his weapon and run away. The soldiers nearby followed the trail of blood and managed to catch him shortly afterwards. Once Dave was awakened from sedation and we were moved to a hospital room and I had, and had a moment to breathe, I remembered something. A week prior to the pigua, I had a very strange nightmare. I was walking alone in an area of abandoned stone ruins. There was a courtyard with green grass, beautiful trees, and large empty rooms with particularly wide entryways. I walked inside, I looked to my left, and saw Jonathan Pollard <laughs> was standing alone in one of the rooms, and we didn't speak to each other. I continued walking and went into a different room. Suddenly, hyenas entered and one of them came running towards me. It dug its teeth into my right knee, and the only way for me to free myself from it was to spin fast in a circle. That would make it loosen its grip and fly off, but it kept coming back to bite me. I repeated the same thing over and over, and then I woke up, it was the morning, and I was very startled. I'm no dream interpreter, but looking back, I do feel that perhaps the dream was some kind of warning for me, a warning that I'll be put through a terrifying ordeal, but will emerge from it, and that's really exactly what happened. Of course, during the pigua, I wasn't thinking about that dream at all. In fact, I was so focused on Dave that it took me a while to digest the fact 
but Hashem spared my life too and didn't even allow me to get a scratch. I decided to send a message to Jonathan Pollard. I knew I would risk sounding like a lunatic, <laughs> but somehow, maybe it was the adrenaline, I had the courage to send that message regardless. And here we are tonight. To me, Jonathan, you represent unbelievable strength, resilience, and courage. It's such an honor to have you and Rivka here tonight. Rav Bar Chaim, Dave and I both feel so grateful to be part of the Machon Shilo community. The Torah you teach has truly enriched our lives. It's a schut to even know the Rav at all. Hashem, thank you for saving us and guarding us. Our <coughs> lives are in your hands. May we be found worthy to fulfill your will in this world, surrounded by people that have true Ahavat Yisrael and Yirat Shemaim. <laughs> for those, of you, for those of you who don't know, David Stern is an expert combat and martial arts instructor, a former U.S. Marine, owner of a homestead next to Itamar, and an activist in Machon Shiloh. He and Rachel have graciously hosted Machon Shiloh at their home and are beloved by our community. A model of Jewish heroism combined with exemplary personal attributes, he is living proof that modern day Jewish heroes do not have to be arrogant or put on airs. They just have to do act in the spirit of the Torah and be courageous. David Stern. Before I begin, I just want to thank everyone who was involved, everyone who was involved in making this event happen tonight. Mic is off. <laughs> yeah, I turn it off. It's part of the speech where everyone tells you you're not allowed. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Before I begin, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in making this event happen. I know it took a lot of effort, and we greatly appreciate it. And your mic is off. It's off again. It's okay. okay. <laughs> it's an incredible honor for us to be here tonight. I want to thank everyone for coming. We're here tonight to give thanks to Hashem for the miracle that he performed for me and Rachel. I learned many incredible lessons from this Pigua. I want to share a few of them with you tonight. One of the lessons I learned from the Pigua is that Hashem can take something so terrible and tragic and in a moment turn it into an incredible blessing. Just as Hashem turned my tragedy into a blessing, I know that he will turn Am Yisrael's tragedy into a blessing. <coughs> One of the incredible gifts that Hashem gave me took place in the ambulance. I lost a lot of blood, and the medics gave me very strong medication. I started to hallucinate. I was being pulled through a dark tunnel. I would be pulled for a while through the tunnel, and then be pulled back into the ambulance. This went on and on for about half an hour. I was sure that this was it. I was dying. Then I was overtaken by a very powerful feeling. I lived a great life. I did what I was supposed to do on this earth, and I felt completely shalem with dying. I even felt a kind of joy. That feeling is still with me now. Hashem gave me the gift of certainty, certainty in my path and in my beliefs, and I finally understood something which had troubled me for many years. Sound effects. It's like, <laughs> very dramatic. <laughs> okay. It's like reenacting. Yeah. <laughs> I finally understood something which had troubled me for many years. Rav Meir Kahana Hashem become the most, in his Sefer Arayon, wrote the following: Dear friend, heed my words about life, words of global importance. Man's life on this earth is exceedingly short. It passes in the blink of an eye. On the one hand, is it of enormous importance, for only through it can a person fulfill his purpose for which he was created. On the other hand, how brief and transient life is, like a shadow that passes, a cloud that vanishes. This carries with it both encouragement and warning. A person must understand his mission on earth and the idea that life was given only to fulfill that mission. He must understand how brief and transient life is and how much emptiness pervades it. Once a person recognizes these truths, he will recognize that he need not fear the day of his death. 
If someone has attained this awareness, what does he lose if he suddenly leaves this world? I was never able to truly understand this. How can a person have no fear? Hashem gave me the gift of understanding that I am doing exactly what I should be doing in the world, and there is no need to fear. Another gift that I was given by Hashem is the gift of perspective. Every day as I do ordinary things, like take my children to school or tuck them in at night, I realize that I was almost taken, that my children could have grown up without us. Every day is a gift from Hashem. I hope that this perspective stays with me forever. Another incredible gift that Rachel and I received was to see the beauty of Am Yisrael. People from all over Israel and the world visited us and contacted us to express their support and their love. It brought us tremendous strength to feel connected to such an incredible people. Am Yisrael is living through a very difficult time. It's easy to fall into a state of despair and hopelessness. The politicians have no answers. They make it seem like the situation is inevitable. They have lost their bearings and have forgotten what our mission is. In these times, what Am Yisrael needs is courage and truth. For Bar Chaim, we are so grateful for your mentorship and your Torah. Your leadership is so desperately needed in these times. It is such an honor, Yonatan and Rivka, to have you here tonight. You represent more than anyone courage and strength and an undying commitment to Emet. Am Yisrael so badly needs the message that you've dedicated your lives to sharing. Just as I realized on a personal level, once Am Yisrael understands and commits itself to its mission, we will have no fear and Hashem will turn our distress into blessing. May Hashem grant us wisdom, strength, and courage. Thank you. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.